Welcome to Beg to Differ, the Bulwark's weekly roundtable discussion featuring civil conversation across the political spectrum. We range from center left to center right. I'm Mona Charon, syndicated columnist and policy editor at Bulwark, and I am joined by our regulars, Bill Galston of the Brookings Institution and the Wall Street Journal, Damon Linker of the Week, and Linda Chavez of the Niskanen Center. Our special guest this week is Peter Weiner, who has many affiliations, could have said New York Times, could have said The Atlantic, could have said Ethics and Public Policy Center, all of the above. Delighted to have you back again, Pete. Thanks, Mona. It's great to be with y'all. All right. Well, we are going to get started with the Summit for Democracy. 110 countries participating at the invitation of President Biden. And there are many hopes for this conference, uh, defending against authoritarianism, fighting corruption, and promoting respect for human rights among them. But I will just toss this first to Damon by saying, whether anything comes from this or not, I am just glad to say that we have a president now who doesn't worship dictators, who understands the importance of human rights. And so at least in that sense, the world seems to be rightly situated on its axis again in some fundamental ways. Well, I uh, share most of those sentiments, all of those sentiments with you, Mona. I think this is a positive development. I don't think I'm quite as maybe over the moon about it as some are. I don't see much of a downside to it, really. I'm a little skeptical about the positive that's going to come out of this, simply because and this is, again, my kind of foreign policy realism showing through. As important as democracy is at home and within countries, that our democracies and maybe are backsliding a little bit over recent years, as the United States obviously has, I question whether putting, quote, democracy at the forefront of how and why we relate to the other countries of the world is necessarily that helpful. We live in a world with a range of regime types, and I think that during the Cold War, it made a lot of sense to care about that as a major determinant of how we judge various countries, precisely because half the world was devoted to an ideology that sought to stamp out freedom and rights and democratic self-government. And so whether a country was on that or the other side made a huge difference to whether they're allies or enemies or rivals. Now, I think things are much more confused and muddled. And it's true that, for instance, Russia and China are not democracies and cause all kinds of problems for us in the world. I don't really know if the thing that is the problem in those relationships is that they are not democracies. I think it's far more that uh, Russia, for instance, is a slowly waning mid-level power trying to maintain some kind of control and influence over its near abroad in areas where it has historically done so, namely Ukraine. Uh, And China is a rapidly rising world power that wants to expand its sphere of influence in its near abroad, which puts it on a collision course with the United States, because ever since the end of World War II, we have left a very strong and large footprint in that part of the world. And so we are on kind of contrary trajectories, but those are problems that don't follow directly from the fact of the regime type, the whether they are democracies or not, they are functions of power and international interstate rivalry. And so in a way, I see this a little bit as a distraction from what's more important, which is is trying to strengthen democracy at home here and at home within many of the countries at this conference. But whether we can build very much on the basis of shared attachment to democracy as a unifying kind of interest for all these dozens of countries, I'm a little skeptical. Hmm. Uh, I was going to go in a different direction, but what you said is interesting. So I, I'm going to come to you next, Pete Weiner. I'm skeptical a little bit of Damon's perspective on this because, look, I think 
the state of democracy in the world of Freedom House, for example, has said that for the last 15 consecutive years, authoritarianism has been on the rise while democracy has been in decline. And there are now twice as many countries that have experienced declines in political and civil liberties than have seen improvements over the last 15 years. It strikes me that that's critical to our well-being and to our sense of comfort in the world. I mean, if China and Russia had systems like Australia and uh, France, we wouldn't regard their rise as threatening, would we? Yeah, I I agree with you. I mean, I I guess I would issue a respectful dissent from what Damon said. I I take his point, but I guess that my response would be that democracy isn't a cure-all. But I do think that advancing democracy, authentic democracy, is in our interest and in the interest of other countries. I think as a general matter, aggressive nations, nations that are warlike, tend to be anti-democratic and more peaceful nations tend not to be. Now, that's not an iron rule, but it's generally the case. And I also think that human flourishing, human rights, and democracy often um, align. Uh, and persecution and oppression and totalitarianism and, and democracy don't. So I think as a general matter, uh, we should be pro-democratic. Then, of course, come the prudential questions, which is how do you advance democracy in other countries? And there are certainly limits to how you do that. There's a whole range, a whole spectrum of things one, that one can do. The other thing I'd say, Mona, is, is I align myself with what you said at the beginning. I don't think that the summit per se is that important. I think the fact that the United States is hosting the summit is important because we had for four years a president who was anti-democratic and his party is becoming increasingly anti-democratic as well. And Joe Biden, for whatever flaws and failures he has, is not that. And so to have a president on the right side of democracy, that used to be a question that you didn't have to ask. It went without saying, we're no longer in that period. So I'm glad uh, we're hosting the summit. Uh, A lot more has to be done than simply a summit, but it could be worse. And for four years, we had something that was worse. Yeah. Uh, Bill Galston, a lot of people think that President Biden is not paying sufficient attention to the threats to democracy here at home. What would you say to that? I will get to that question soon, but just some comments on the dialogue that has preceded me. I'm not a realist in foreign policy, but I do think that it's important to be realistic and to take into account all of the available evidence. Political scientists, particularly political scientists in the area of international relations, don't agree on very much. But over the past few decades, they have really converged around the finding that's called the democratic peace, namely the empirical proposition that democracies are much less likely to go to war against one another uh, than are non-democracies to go to war against democracies. And I don't think it's an accident, comrades, that if we array the worst threats to our security and to the security of other nations, I come up with four in the A category, Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea. They have one very important thing in common. They are not democracies and they're proud of it. I think we have to pay attention to that. Imagine what the world would be like if we had not undergone the very difficult task of reconstructing our defeated foes, especially Germany and Japan, after World War II into stable, functioning democracies. What do you think our relations with them would be like now? And what do you think they would be doing to the other nations of the region. I'm glad that's just a thought experiment. So I think that in the name of being realistic, we have to pay attention to the internal character of the regimes of other nations and not just our own. That is not an argument for invading other countries uh, to make them into democracies. With very few exceptions, that has not worked out well. And the American people certainly would not support that. But I believe they will support the kind of venture uh, that President Biden and his administration 
have embarked on. Now, with regard to President Biden ignoring democracy here at home, he has stated many times that strengthening democracy here at home means first and foremost demonstrating to the American people and to others that democracy can deliver the goods for the people. He believes, and this would be a very interesting discussion, that the weakening of confidence in democracy stems mostly from its failure to solve public problems. And he is trying to put that proposition to the test. I'm sure there's something to it. Has he spent as much time as many people are urging him to do on sort of rules-based threats to democracy at home, like this limitation on voting rights and other threats to the electoral process? Probably not. But on the other hand, he has had a very hard time mustering a majority for such changes uh, in the Congress of the United States. And he has no control whatsoever over developments at the state level. So I can't find it in my heart to blame him too much for the course that he has adopted. I am so glad you mentioned that, Bill, because this is something I'd like to explore a little further with Linda, because I too think that President Biden sees defending American democracy at home as a matter of delivering the goods. He has said that many times. I find that very discomforting. It makes it seem as if, now this may be cheapening it a little bit, and maybe this isn't quite what he intended, but it sort of sounds like, yeah, you know, in order to have confidence in democracy, the government has to shovel money out the door and make people feel like they're getting their money's worth out of democracy or making it a, an exchange or a transaction. And in fact, the great gift of democracy is legitimacy, is the sense that the people really do rule, that your liberties are intact, that the police aren't going to be able to just march into your house and cart you off, et cetera, et cetera. And so I'm a little bit concerned about the Biden, we have to prove democracy delivers line. What do you make of it, Linda? Well, I'm troubled by it as well, as you might imagine. It's almost as if he believes, gee, if all of those people who stormed the Capitol had really understood that the COVID relief checks were in the mail, and gee, we've got Build Back Better coming, and maybe they wouldn't have stormed it. The fact is, democracy is in a very, very tenuous state right now in the United States, probably the most tenuous state that we have seen since the Civil War. And I think that bears a kind of discussion of democracy and the foundations of democracy and what you mentioned, which is basically that democracy only functions when the people who are part of the democratic process are willing to accept the results of elections. And legitimacy of our form of government is very much under assault right now. So I think confusing that with basically, you know, if government worked better, maybe people would be more uh, pro-democracy, meaning that there are more goodies that government hands out to a larger swath of the American public. That's wrongheaded. I do think that it was a much clearer kind of discussion that we could have, I think, as uh, someone stated earlier, during the Cold War era, when we had the democratic world united against communism and communism led by the Soviet Union, but, you know, with its manifestations in China as well, and communism basically trying to spread abroad and taking up larger and larger swaths of territory in Asia, in Latin America, and Africa. I think it was these kinds of conferences, these kinds of pulling people together to talk about the value of democracy was much more clear cut. Now we have the prospect of countries, particularly after the fall of the Soviet Union and after Eastern Europe experienced freedom and democracy, now we have the prospect of countries like Hungary and elsewhere, Poland, other places, that had moved into the democratic sphere who now have begun to backtrack. We even have Turkey that was not invited to the conference that presents a problem. 
And so being very clear headed, understanding that this is not about government working. This is about the kind of government that we have. What are the institutions? What are the fundamentals? What are the foundations that both create and sustain a democracy? And that that has to be the focus and that the president has to be very clear-minded and speak about that in ways that don't make this sound like a politics. Okay, we've got two hands up. So first to Bill Galston. Just very briefly, I think it caricatures the president's proposition to equate it with shoveling money out the door. I mean, it's a matter of historical record that when economic bad times arrive, that democracies tend to weaken. And that was certainly true in the late 1920s and early 1930s. And confidence in democracy has weakened around the world in the wake of the Great Recession. This is not a matter of theory. It's fact. So to put it as simply as possible, ordinary people, most people, judge democracy not just by its roots, its principles, but also its fruits. And telling them that they ought to judge it simply as a matter of principle while paying no attention to its performance is not realistic as a projection for the future, and it misreads the past. Fair enough. I would just say this, Bill. It seems to me that Biden's focus on delivery is just missing a very big piece of this, which is that what is happening at the state level and with the Republican Party, which we're going to come to in in another segment, but the process of attempting to remove secretaries of state who failed to decertify the votes, et cetera, et cetera. Those are direct attacks on the processes of democracy. They are a direct threat to the legitimacy of our system. And therefore, their higher priority, it seems to me, than making sure that government delivers. But in any event, we will come to that. So if you wouldn't mind, don't answer that yet. We're going to come to it in the next segment. Pete Wayne. Yes, (laughs) ma'am. Yeah, and I know we'll get to the Republican Party. I wanted to pick up on one point that Linda mentioned and, and quickly build on it because I think it's relevant to this topic, and that's Hungary. Hungary was one of the nations that was not invited to the summit, I think rightly so. And if you read the Freedom House Index on countries and freedom, Hungary has moved away from democracy and toward authoritarianism. What's relevant in this discussion is that Hungary has become a kind of model country for some people on the American right, Patrick Deneen, Tucker Carlson, and others, and Viktor Orban is a celebrated figure. That that is quite alarming because something that had been disguised is no longer disguised, and there is an embrace in the American right of a country which is anti-democratic and increasingly authoritarian. And that's something to pay attention to just in terms of this battle, this internal battle in America about democracy. Because in the past, America, though its record is of course mixed on a whole variety of fronts, at least in the last half century or more, has been essentially on the side of democracy. And that is increasingly less the case internally and that matters in this larger struggle. Yeah, absolutely. I will just note that Max Boot in his column this week took note of the fact that both China and Russia have denounced this conference in a joint piece that they wrote in the national interest. And it's actually a little bit amusing that China describes itself as, quote, an extensive whole process socialist democracy. And the Russians call themselves a democratic, federative, law governed state with a republican form of government. It just, it's hilarious. And it reminds me of the jokes that we used to tell during the Cold War, which some of which featured lines like, if a country has the word democratic in its title, it's not. <laughs> Anyway, all right, let us move on. A 15-year-old, a student in Michigan, took a gun to a school and shot up his uh, classmates. He killed four and uh, wounded many others. This has become so routine in America that it is to our eternal shame. But this story had a slightly different outcome from the usual in that the parents of this boy were charged for not keeping their gun locked up. They had, in fact, purchased the gun for the 15-year-old as a Christmas present, 
and uh, it was available to him. But it struck me as one possible step back in the direction towards sanity. So Pete Weiner, what do you make of this? I'm not sure what I make of it, and I'll tell you why. I think it's a complicated issue. I was initially dubious about the decision to indict, but there are complicating factors. It was involuntary manslaughter charges that were the ones that were issued. And there were two elements, as I understand the case. There was the fact that they allowed their son access to the handgun, and the trial will reveal whether that was true or not. And then there was the issue of ignoring warning signs that this child was on the brink of violence. And that one gets complicated because the note that he left that was so alarming, which had a drawing of an image of a gun and a person shot and a laughing of emojis, blood everywhere. And then he said, the thoughts won't stop, help me. Yeah. That note was discovered the morning of the shooting. Now the school called the parents and they didn't pull him out of class. If that note had appeared a day before or a week before, um, that would be even more more troubling. Holding parents responsible for the actions of their children when their children are clearly mentally disordered, that's a high, high bar that needs to be cleared. But it shouldn't be an impossible one. And this may clear it. But I'm reserving judgment just for the trial to find out the facts. I'm open to it, but this kind of thing as a general matter should be used very sparingly. Um, I don't pretend that the prosecutors are being promiscuous in this in this charge. I understand the moral logic as well as the legal logic behind it, but I really feel like I've, I want to listen to the trial to find out more. So I'm, I'm somewhat undecided and ambivalent on it right now. Okay. Linda, only 14 states in the District of Columbia have laws that require gun owners to keep their weapons locked and unavailable to minors in the home. Does that strike you as something that's a terrible imposition on people's liberty to have a law like that? Well, whether it's an imposition on people's liberty or not, I certainly advocate making sure that youngsters don't have access to guns. But it's not as simple a case as we might hope. We don't know the extent to which this kid had mental illness and presented as someone with mental illness. We do know that he didn't appear to have any kind of record of misbehavior at the school. The advisability of buying your minor son a semi-automatic handgun, you know, it's not something I would do. Whether the state of Michigan allows a parent to do that, I think it does. So, yes, they certainly should not have made this gun as accessible as they did. But I'm not sure I am ready quite yet to make parents responsible in these conditions. The fact is, the school became alerted and aware enough to call in the parents and to have a conference, at least the counselors did. The school had the right to check his backpack and didn't. The school had the right to check his locker and didn't. So I'm just a little nervous about jumping to conclusions until we know all of the facts. And whether or not we need to pass laws that make all uh, adults responsible for what children do, I think that might be a slippery slope. I'm not sure I'm ready to go there yet. Well, I, you don't necessarily have to go there to endorse laws that require guns to be locked up. Well, let me just speak about that for a second. I have lived in rural areas where police could not get to me in less than about half an hour. And I've had a break-in in one of those places when I was there. I own guns. I own two pistols. Having those guns locked up and inaccessible to me when I'm in those situations, I'm not sure I would like a law that said that I had to have it locked in my safe when I'm what not. What if you had a gun safe that opens in three seconds with a code? Well, making guns themselves only accessible with keypads or something like that is, I guess, one possibility. But again, we do have an amendment that says that one does have the right to bear arms and it's been upheld. I would not like to be required to have that gun locked up until the moment when I absolutely need it, because in that moment, I might not be able to get to it. 
So okay, I've got mixed feelings about this, Mona. This is why okay. I'm a conservative. <laughs> I'm not quite. I, I know that my friends in the conservative movement think I've jumped over on the other side, but I'm not 100% on the other side yet. Nobody who listens to this podcast thinks that. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody. All right. So, so Damon, in addition to other problems tearing at the fabric of our culture, we have the kind of gun fetishism that's become popular on the right. Thomas Massey posed for his Christmas picture with his family in front of the Christmas tree, all holding long guns. Lauren Boebert, to do him one better, posed with her children, many of whom seem to be under the age of eight, posing with guns. Ted Cruz, for one of his ads when he was running for Senate last time, featured him frying bacon on some sort of automatic weapon. I don't know much about which kind it is. Anyway, I can remember the day when the NRA was known mostly for its gun safety, would you know host classes about responsible gun ownership and so forth. And now our culture, at least on the right, there's this fetishization of it, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. And I, you know, it's interesting on the podcast a little bit, but then in my writing as well, and in some of the writers I like most of all these days, like Matt Iglesias, they're frequently brought up the way that the progressive faction and the Democratic Party stake out positions that really alienate a lot of voters. And it would be much better for their party if they would stop doing that. Well, it works the other way, too. And, you know, I used to be something of a conservative, and I voted for Republicans in the past. But at some point, I became a kind of almost principled anti-Republican. And what you were talking about here is no small part of that. I'm not like going to go out and call for the repeal of the Second Amendment, which would be impossible anyway. I don't care if people own guns, if they're law-abiding citizens and they obey the laws to get them and so forth and using them in lawful ways. But as you describe it, this gun fetishism and the way that the Republican Party has tried to embrace it and using it in the ways you described, like Boebert and Cruz and others in holiday images images and so forth really sort of turns my stomach. And when I see that kind of stuff, I think you don't want me or anyone like me to vote for you, do you? Because these are weapons that increase the potential lethality of a human being by an almost infinite factor. They are weapons that can be used to hunt and kill animals, but far more often are used in our popular culture and in our everyday fantasizing about the world as weapons of death and of human beings. And you hear it in death threats of people on both sides of the spectrum regularly now. And It's not healthy, and it's like sinking back into a kind of barbarism, frankly, and away from civilization. Yeah, if you live in a rural place and there aren't police within a half hour, then yeah, it probably makes sense to have a gun, just as it did on the frontier when there was no law and order whatsoever. But the fact is, most people these days do not need to rely on themselves to defend themselves against violence and crime. They're supposed to be relying on the government, the state, police, people who exist to keep public order. And the fact that so many people seem to prefer to actually kind of DIY, I'll do it myself, I'll protect myself and my family with this gigantic semi-automatic gun that allows me to fulfill a kind of fantasy of war. It's not a good thing for American democracy, in my opinion. Bill Galston, since 1999, children have committed at least 145 school shootings. And among the 105 cases in which the weapon's source was identified, 80% were obtained from the child's home or that of relatives or friends. And every single day, eight children or teenagers are unintentionally shot in what is called family fire. That is a shooting involving an improperly stored or misused gun found in the home. So, It just seems to me that it's one thing to talk about the Second Amendment in the abstract, but 
it strikes me that in an era since Columbine, the last roughly 20 years, when school shootings and public mass shootings have become a cultural pattern, that that imposes certain obligations on gun owners to be careful about the way their guns are stored and make sure that they don't fall into the wrong hands. Your view? <laughs> well, you've stated my case more crisply and with better evidence than I would have. I, oh. think, your, I think your question is better addressed to Linda than it is to me. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I will say this, if parents are not at least somewhat responsible for the behavior of their children, who is? I don't see a moral affront. Now, obviously, there are limits to that, but it doesn't seem to me that exercising due diligence to make sure that your underage child is not using a lethal weapon, except under your supervision and with your consent, and is not taking it where it doesn't belong, like a public square or, God forbid, a public school, that does not seem to me to be an undue imposition on liberty. And, you know, I would remind the defenders of the untrammeled Second Amendment that every single right in the Constitution is exercised with due regard for other values and other constitutional principles, norms, and institutions. There is no right without limitations to accommodate other considerations. Everybody knows this. And so the question is whether what you're proposing, basically a due diligence requirement for parents, breaches the boundaries of permissible limitations on this one amendment. And I have two answers to your question. One is no, and the other is hell no. <laughs> <laughs> well, you and I are in agreement on this. And by the way, even in the days when I was firmly on the right, even then, I always had misgivings about the sort of absolutism on the Second Amendment that I found among my colleagues. But uh, well, anyway, can I can I at least associate? Yes, Linda, can go I for at it. At least associate my myself with uh, Damon. Um, I do, you know, I do think that responsible gun ownership is, in fact, guaranteed by the Constitution, and I exercise that right uh, to own a gun. I also try to be responsible and do have gun safes in both you know, properties where I keep a gun. But the whole fetishism around guns that permeates the Republican Party, frankly, nauseates me. The idea of sending out a Christmas card uh, with myself and my, you know, 357, uh, much less one that also <laughs> included my children and grandchildren in it. What does that uh, card say? Peace on earth, good will to man. I know, I know <laughs> right. Oh, I mean, that, is, that that's just, I, I, look, I think it's sick. And I do think that uh, uh, some of our friends on the right have just gone crazy on this issue. And the Boebert card and the other congressman's card, whose name I've already forgotten, Thomas the Massey, Tom Massey. Yeah. Tom Massey, uh, you know, I thought they, they were disgusting. Okay, let us move on to something else that's probably going to be seen as disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> Which brings us to the state of the Republican Party and the continuing presence of Trump and Trumpism. So there were a number of stories over the last several weeks demonstrating that Donald Trump continues to exert extreme influence over Republicans. This week we had David Perdue announce that he is going to make a primary challenge against Brian Kemp for governor of Georgia. Kemp, who is nobody's idea of a rhino, nevertheless, uh, is is in Trump's bad books because he failed to um, to pervert the election and deliver Georgia for Trump against the wishes of Georgia's voters. So now that's going to be a contest. Of course, also in Georgia, we have um, the Trump-endorsed uh, Jody Heiss, who's a member of Congress, is running for Secretary of State against Brad Raffensperger. Raffensperger's sin was even worse than Kemp's, actually, because he f was the Secretary of State, it still is, and uh, refused several pleadings and imprecations from Trump to uh, to deliver 11,780 votes 
uh, which was what he needed <laughs> to swing the state, and on and on. So I'll start with you this time, Damon. The Republican Party is showing no signs of being post-Trump, and it is showing many signs of being post-democracy. Yeah, it's a it's a strange, strange situation we're in here, and I I don't want to make light of it by kind of slightly laughing because it, it's it is it is pretty horrifying, but it it's sort of baffling because outside of the Republican Party, there is absolutely nothing that any of us can do about this. And in fact, to the extent that we acknowledge it's happening and talk about it and condemn it. We're sort of giving them exactly what they want, and that that in a way loops back to the the to the Bobert Christmas card with the guns we were just discussing. I mean, why does that card exist? It's not because Bobert is trying to get her constituents to say "Yay, guns!" It's a troll. It's an attempt to get liberals, or at least liberal-minded centrists and conservatives to be upset and to talk about it and to denounce it. And you see the same the same dynamic throughout the Republican Party where politics is being transmuted into this effort to simply outrage liberals and anyone who isn't a Trump supporter and doesn't see politics in that way as a kind of performance art to outrage your opponents. And then, of course, there's the, the business that we see in the Georgia governor's race and throughout the, the country and secretary of state races and uh, appointments and so forth. The continual insistence that anyone who is in a position of authority in the Republican Party has to spout the big lie about the uh, election results in 2020. And there's no sign of that waning at all, at least at the level of rhetoric. Now, interestingly, you know, we have things like Glenn Youngkin won his race in Virginia. I tended not to think that if he lost by a few points, he would have accused would have accused the system of being rigged against him and the election of having been stolen. Uh, we're going to face a series of tests on this in the 2022 midterm elections where there are bound to be some races where Republicans are going to lose by a narrow margin. And we'll see, does this happen a dozen times? Anytime a Republican of a certain kind loses a race, do they accuse the system of having stolen the votes from them? The more that continues, News, the more it creates, as we've seen uh, over and over since last January 6th, a kind of subculture in American politics that believes that the only legitimate election is one in which their own side wins. If you lose, it wasn't a fair election. If you win, it was. And that's an assumption that is incompatible with the uh, free and peaceful exchange of, of party and power. So it, it's, it continues to be alarming. And as we've, we've indicated before, and Mona, you already did, it's a situation that isn't changing or lessening one little bit yet. And it, it's scary. Yeah. So uh, Pete Weiner, um in Tim Alberta's piece profiling Congressman Meyer from Michigan, who was one of the 10 who voted to impeach Trump the second time, he did so as a freshman. You know, he he talks about how this is Alberta speaking that uh, that Republicans, you know, at first thought in 2016 they just had to wait for Trump to implode. Then when he didn't and he was elected, they thought they just had to wait out the presidency and then things would all you know, sort of settled that, and and now they're they're saying, well, they just have to wait out this next phase, and they never, never have the courage to to take matters into their own hands, or just the the, the one example that just is so galling to me is the the second impeachment, where all of these Republican senators who had every incentive just from their own personal self-interest, right? Like people who want to run for president themselves, like Cruz and Cotton and, and any number of others, they had a chance to vote to impeach him. And he could have been barred from 
serving. It would have been a great service to, to democracy, to the country, and even to themselves, and yet they couldn't do it. And so here we are. Yeah, I, I quite agree with you. I, I will say, though, and this goes to the, to the deeper, I think, more fundamental problem, which is if any of those people had stood against Trump, um, the base would have turned on them ferociously, which it truly really is the problem. And this goes to your earlier point. And I thought that that paragraph that you cited from Tim Alberta was one of the best and most important in a really interesting essay, which is Republicans and people on the right have engaged in this game. Um, this rationalization uh, for as long as Trump has has been on the political stage, uh, which is if we just go quiet, this will fade away and things will snap back. And one of the real sins against people on the right who knew better is that they went sort of voce, they went quiet, um, because for a variety of you know of reasons. But I think in the end, in a lot of cases, it was a loss of courage, failure of moral courage. And what that ended up doing is it seeded the narrative to um, these really pernicious and malicious forces and allowed them to, to dominate uh, the, the narrative. And the other thing that it did that they, I think those people never fully appreciated or even um, appreciated to any extent was when you indulge these kind of conspiracy theories and lies and cruelty and crudity for um, four years, it has a deforming effect on the base of the party. That's what they never really appreciated. So this idea that when Trump lost the presidency, the party would snap back was fundamentally wrong because they didn't know what they had been complicit in. And and one other thing is, um, Mona, in terms of how, how you frame this, the way I think about it is we may be post-Trump, the Republican Party may still be anti-democratic. That is, Trump's hold on the party is inevitably going to weaken. It has to over time because he's no longer president. But it may well be that far too many people on the American right have internalized his worst instincts, his worst sentiments, anti-democratic sentiments, conspiracy theories. And so you have many Trumps and copycat Trumps, and they may not be identical uh, in, in how Trump would, would act, but on the, most, on the deepest level, um, they are a danger to the, uh, to the republic. And in that way, it may be more of a threat than a cult of personality, because when you have a cult of personality and the cult leader disappears or dies, the cult dies. In this case, Trump may fade away, but he has catalyzed in motion a whole series of destructive tendencies that the Republican Party, instead of rejecting, seems to be embracing and becoming, in some respects, more, not less radical since Trump was president. Yeah. Linda, I consider myself a former Republican, um, but, uh, but one thing that strikes me is that the Democratic Party which, as somebody has already said, doesn't have that much influence here, but they can do a few things uh, with the power they currently have. And um, I, I know I'm going to be accused of beating a dead horse or beating a drum too much, perhaps, but I, I am kind of obsessed with the Electoral Count Act and their failure to reform it because to return to the image from the previous segment, I mean, there is a loaded gun on the table called the Electoral <laughs> Count Act that we that the Republicans have demonstrated a willingness to abuse already, and so it it just I'm I'm amazed that the Democrats don't see that as more urgent that they need to to reform that law so that it isn't possible so that it isn't let's put it this way so that it isn't easy for Republicans to just discount the votes of voters in key states and steal the election that way. Yeah, I, I'm absolutely 100% with you on this, Mona. Uh, as you know, uh, I think the real danger to democracy in terms of voting right now is not so much some of the laws that have been passed in various states that uh, change some of the, the rules about how you cast a vote, because in most instances, they are not drastically restricting the right um, and access to the polls. I think the real problem is nullification of the vote after it's already taken place. And what we saw in the John Eastman memo uh, was a recipe for how to undo uh, the results of an election. And it really did center on flaws with the Electoral Count Act. And that, I think, is a 
tremendous danger. And, you know, we, we only have a few years to fix this. And by the way, the Democrats are very likely to lose control of at least one house, possibly uh, both uh, chambers in, in, of Congress. And if that were to happen, then you won't see anything happen with the Electoral Count Act. And so uh, I don't know why they are not more focused on this. I think it's a, a serious threat to democracy. It, uh, it's got to be fixed. And, you know, it goes back to some of our earlier discussion about how the Democrats see democracy and how they see their role. And bringing home the bacon uh, is, has been very much the focus uh, of this administration. And everything is being thrown in on the Reconciliation Act, the Build Back Better, all of the, uh, these uh, programs uh, for spending and too little attention on, you know, the things that are going to make it possible for our democracy to survive. So I, I don't I don't know how to explain why they are so blind on this, why they're not willing to do it. It's it's almost as if they think they've got to get this spending bill passed first and uh, they don't want to jeopardize anything. All of their eggs are in that basket. Well, you know, the, the basket's going to be tipped over and they're, all the eggs are going to be broken if we don't fix this very important law that's going to determine how we count electoral votes next time around. Bill Valston, let's imagine it's December 9th, 2022, and the midterms are behind us and the Democrats have lost control of let's say both houses, uh, which could happen. Maybe Senate a lot less likely than, than the House. But in any event, are Democrats going to be kicking themselves for having lost the chance to protect democracy in, a, in the ways that really mattered? Well, I will accept the premise of your question <laughs> and move on. Uh, there is, in my judgment, no way that the Democrats can do this by themselves. If Republicans are not willing partners, I didn't say equal partners, but at least willing partners in an exercise such as the revision of the Electoral Count Act, it will not happen. This is not the sort of thing that can be done by simple majority vote. It's not the sort of thing that can be crammed through via reconciliation. And so as a realistic political matter, what are the chances that Republicans are going to be willing to cooperate with Democrats in this venture? And you'd need at least 10 of them because there's no evidence that the Republican Party as a whole is willing to go down this road. Among other things, there's no way of going down this road without coming out foursquare against the sorts of tactics that Donald Trump was determined to use, tried to force others to use in the Justice Department, even his own vice president, uh, and has, has never repudiated and would use again. So I think this discussion is you know, the equivalent of the old economist's joke about you know, an economist caught on a desert island with a case of canned food which he cannot open, finally he gets an inspiration and says, I, I've got it, assume a can opener. So before we berate the Biden administration for not going down this road, we have to ask ourselves whether it's mission impossible or not. And as exhibit A, I advance uh, Joe Manchin's compromise bill on voting rights which he basically wrote himself in the belief that if he dramatically trimmed and moderated the other Democratic bills, he would surely get a lot of Republican collaborators and signatories. And I think we all know how that's worked out. So President Biden up to now has focused on what he thinks he can get done, either in areas where Republicans are willing to cooperate with him or in areas where Democrats by themselves can get the job done. I happen to believe that the Electoral Count Act, revising it, is extremely important. And I hope that President Biden at least surfaces the issue next year. But I have zero confidence 
for all of the reasons previously stated in this analysis of the contemporary Republican Party, that it would be met with a responsible response. And please tell me why my analysis is wrong. Well, since you invited me. Uh, <laughs> I did indeed. <laughs> okay. This is the way I here's, learned. <laughs> here's, here's what I think you're missing, and that is that the Democrats do have 51 votes in the Senate for now, for the next year. With that 51 vote margin, they can enact either a carve out to the filibuster or they can nuke the filibuster on this issue alone. They have that option. And it's understood that Manchin you know, is very much opposed to doing so, but it has been yoked to other reforms of voting, which may not be as straightforward and as clear cut a case. And so it seems to me that somebody in the White House or you know, certainly leading voices on the Democratic side should be making the case that leave aside all the other stuff and just focus on the Electoral Count Act, put a carve out to the filibuster or make a talking filibuster or do something um, that permits Manchin to go along with uh, with passing just the reform of that and get that done. <laughs> well, I don't think we have time to continue this debate, but okay. believe me, I have a reply. Okay. All right. Well, we'll come back to it another time. And with that, we come to our next segment. Our highlight or low light of the week. And I will start with you, Linda. Well, my highlight of the week is a poll out by the Pew Hispanic uh, Research Organization. Uh, and it's my highlight because it vindicates something that I believe. Many of you have heard the term Latinx uh, being used to describe people of Hispanic origin. Uh, it's become very popular. The New York Times uses it. NPR uses it. Uh, lots of uh, different uh, left-leaning groups uh, prefer the term because uh, the previous preferred term, Latino, is a gendered word. And as a result, uh, those who do not identify as either male or female, um, as non-binary, for example, uh, don't like the term. And therefore, that is why Latinx was adopted by the left. Well, it turns out that Hispanics themselves, and by the way, two-thirds of those of, of uh, that origin uh, do prefer to be called Hispanic, do not like the term. Only about 3% use the term Latinx. Only one in four of those who've even heard of the term uh, use it. But the preferred term turns out to be Hispanic with uh, about 61% of Hispanics preferring that term to describe the population and about one in three preferring the term uh, Latino. So Latinx, uh, in my view, should be consigned to the uh, dustbin of history. <laughs> yep, you can hear it on NPR any day of the week. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Damon Linker. Well, um, we started with uh, with my comments uh, this afternoon about foreign policy, which are usually not very popular here on the podcast. Um, <laughs> and so it, it's fitting that I actually have a pair of uh, very good pieces from this week on this theme. Uh, any listeners who want to learn a little bit more about where I'm coming from on, uh, on foreign policy could look at these pieces. One is an interesting essay by Michael Ignatieff, who's a, a Canadian. Uh, politician, thinker, biographer of Isaiah Berlin, a fabulous biography of Berlin, uh, and also was the, uh, I forget the title, chancellor or president of Central European University in Budapest, which was summarily kicked out by Viktor Orban. Um, he's written uh, a piece for Persuasion uh, online titled The Collapse of Liberal Internationalism. The author, Ignatiev, was a, a very prominent liberal defender of uh, the Iraq War, and he was known for quite a while in that period as supporting a more aggressive foreign policy for the sake of spreading democracy, and he's admitting in this piece that it didn't really work out as hoped, and reflecting on where to go from here. And then in addition to that, my friend and colleague at The Week, uh, Noah Millman, has an excellent longer essay on his Substack titled Gideon Substack. The piece itself is titled Requiem for a Liberal Internationalism That Never Really 
was one cheer for Michael Ignatiev's attempt at a reckoning. Um, that piece in particular, Millman's piece, I really do strongly recommend as a very thoughtful attempt to think in a realistic way about the world order, where we go from here, and one that does take democracy and liberalism very seriously while also realizing the limits on our ability to spread it around the world as we would, would like so much to do in our hearts. And I, I count myself as that, as someone who would love, like very much to wake up tomorrow and find the whole world to be filled with democracies, not inclined to go to war with one another, as, as Bill Galston talked about in his comments earlier. Uh, so those are my two recommendations for the week, both good reads. Thank you. Okay, Peter Weiner. Yeah, I, uh, I'll, I'll focus on a, on a highlight um, of the week, which was the outpouring of respect for uh, Bob Dole, um, who, who died at the age of 98 on, uh, on Sunday, and his body now lies at state in the, in the capital rotunda. Bob Dole was not a particular model uh, for, for me as, as a politician. Um, he wasn't, in, in my estimation, a, a conviction politician, like the kind that I've been drawn to, and I felt like he was too pro-Nixon after the crimes of Watergate were clear, and he was pro-Trump when I thought he shouldn't have been. But he did love his institution, um, and uh, in a party that now has a lot of institutional nihilists and, and arsonists, that is a good thing. But beyond that, and I think really what's what's most behind this outpouring of uh, respect and, and affection for Dole was what he did in the uh, mountains of um, of Northern Italy when he was 21 years old. And it was extraordinary. He, he went to save a fellow soldier. Part of his body was, was blown apart. He was in a foxhole for nine hours uh, in a blood-soaked uniform. Uh, he almost died. He came back. He almost died from kidney infection. He went down to 120 pounds. He was six foot two. He was uh, in recovery for three years. And it was an extraordinarily arduous and difficult journey. And he put his life back together and he put his body back together as best he could. And he lived an honorable life. And that um, and that matters in a life of, of valor and uh, and bravery. And um, it's important that a country and the people of a country um, pay homage to uh, to someone like uh, like him. And I'm glad that we have. Yes. Thank you for that. By the way, he also lived with disability for the rest of his life. One of his arms was completely useless and the other he only had limited use of. So so life was never easy for him after grievous injury. And one of his fists, I recall, was permanently in a um, clenched position. And he used to insert a pen into that hand to make it look less odd that his that he always had his hand in a fist. It's just I was touched when I when I learned that when he ran for president in 1996, it was the sort of thing, that, you know, gosh, you know, the things that people are self-conscious about. And anyway, it's just a, it was touching. Bill Galston. Well, in addition to his other virtues, not all of which have been enumerated up to now, he was one of the funniest men in Washington <laughs> in a very wintry Midwestern <laughs> way that I can recognize having worked for Walter Mondale for two and a half years. And my favorite Bob Dole story concerns the new Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich, who once walked up to Dole you know, sincerely per perplexed and disturbed and said, Bob, Bob, why do people take an instant dislike to me? <laughs> and Dole thought for a minute and then growled back, save some time. <laughs> uh, yes. yes. Uh, and he had, you know, he, he had various other wintry, but very funny, spontaneous retorts. There was nothing rehearsed about the man. He was also, by the way, the great champion of bipartisan legislation, starting with, but certainly not ending with, the Americans with Disabilities Act. And he supported, as a good Midwesterner, a generous attitude towards the food stamp program and a number of other things that I think you know, count in, in his favor, at least in my eyes. Well, yeah, I do too, except, of course, you know. Those food stamp programs are awfully good for the farmers in Kansas. Well, they are, but, uh, <laughs> you know, there are a lot of Midwestern conservatives, you know, who put limited government ahead of 
using agricultural abundance to help poor people. So right. I do think he gets his due measure of credit okay. for that. All right. Fair Was enough. it pure altruism? No. Okay. But let me get to my <laughs> yes. let, me, uh, let me get to my recommendation, a highlight, and it is to a small extent self-serving, but I'll do it anyway. Ron Brownstein, I believe, is one of our very best, most insightful political analysts. He uses data and history in ways that I can admire without being able to emulate fully. He has a new article in The Atlantic called Democrats Are Losing the Culture War, which I think puts on the table in a very, very penetrating way uh, the dilemma that the Democratic Party is now facing in that realm. Yes, full disclosure, I make a cameo appearance in the piece, but I'd recommend it strongly even if I didn't. Okay. I would like to highlight a piece that David Brooks wrote in uh, The Atlantic this week, What Happened to American Conservatism. And he writes, the rich tradition I fell in love with has been reduced to Fox News and voter suppression. And um, it's a it's a bit of a valentine to his conservative heroes and his intellectual development. And he's he's he, it's also an elegy. You know, the fact is that the conservative movement of today is is just unrecognizable compared to what it once was. And I, as somebody who, you know, I'm roughly the same generation as David Brooks, and I had many of the same experiences and, and loves, and this really resonated with me. And uh, it's a, it's a wonderful piece. He talks about how, uh, you know, he began life as a young socialist and then recognized that one of the virtues of conservatism is modesty about what it's possible to know and what it's possible to achieve. And that the sort of the Burkean insight that that gradual change is better than abrupt or revolutionary change for a whole series of reasons. And um, anyway, many other insights. And then, of course, he he contrasts that with what he says is, to quote him, today's conservatism, a set of resentful animosities, a partisan attachment to Donald Trump or Tucker Carlson, a sort of mental brutalism. Well put. Highly recommend this piece by David Brooks in The Atlantic. And I want to thank Peter Weiner for joining us this week. I want to thank all of you for listening, and we'll be back next week as every week. 